Good afternoon, observers. We're going to be doing this video a little differently at the request of some folks who work at a university who will not be named. Um, it is quite often that I get emails from people who are interested in a story that appeared in the morning news. I would say it happens every single day. Um, but we're doing this video a little differently and perhaps appropriately so because what's happening this week is a little different as I do not often have a ton of the professors that I interact with, the scientists who work at NASA, NOAA, the USGS, National Weather Service, IPS, ESA, the national labs. It's very rare that I get a story that's got them all talking. And the story this week came from what is inarguably the most well-read and potentially the most important scientific publication uh, today in the world, and that is Nature. The article was about extinctions on the planet and how they're going to be using supercomputers, teasing out the data to try to better pinpoint uh, the accuracy of exactly when some of the great extinctions occurred. You know, it's one thing to say the dinosaurs were wiped out 65 million years ago, but what if you could pinpoint it to within 25 or 26,000 years? That's a significant improvement. And that's what they think they're going to be able to do with things like what happened to the dinosaurs and some of the other great extinctions, maybe even going back hundreds of millions of years. But almost like an afterthought at the end of the article, they come and discuss how this is also going to help them better understand the smaller and more recurring uh, extinctions, sort of like what we have been talking about on the channel quite a bit. And what really shocked everyone was they said that, you know, and for those in the field who know, these things are supposed to take tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, even the, the rapid ones, the ones that happen more often. Uh, and what it really comes down to is they're saying finally that, yes, this may have been, you know, there may be examples of extinctions that took 100,000 years. Um, and then there are examples of where it was just a bad week for Earth. And that really is emblematic of the event that we are talking about here and that we have been talking about for quite some time. And the fact that this appeared in nature, as we were talking about on our weekly podcast over on the website, it matters because whether they're getting it in their hands or they're going to be reading it online, an unfathomable number of the world's top scientists are going to be seeing this and digesting this and thinking about the more recurring, um, more you know, short term, you know, short time in between extinctions in a completely different way. This is something that we had been recently looking at um, with a Dr. Roger Higgs, and we had also briefly discussed how difficult it is sometimes to determine whether some formation in geology uh, or in sediment is the product of thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years of the slow crawl of geology, of rain, of wind, uh, of tectonic creep, things like that, or whether or not these things were rapidly deposited by a tsunami or an earthquake or something to that effect. It's very difficult to tell sometimes. and. This is what they're really starting to tease out. It's a nice bit of synergy to get this article that really sort of makes us think in this way. Um, but for those who um, this video is really meant for, which would be, um, I'll just say it, it would be the, the three professors who are looking to sway others in their departments. The number one geophysics journal in the world is Reviews of Geophysics. And earlier this year, uh, and we actually interviewed one of the authors, uh, Dr. James Channel. And essentially, just looking at the ultraviolet exposure of the surface due to ozone depletion and due to the loss of magnetic strength in Earth's dynamo, the life on Earth is subject to considerable risk. In fact, this paper was talking a lot about how this was probably able to do in the Neanderthals all by itself. And when you consider the fact that there's much more than just the ultraviolet at play here, there's cosmic rays which have an effect on the climate. There are cosmic rays that play a role in our health actually as well, whether it's neutron hits which can damage DNA or whether it's other electromagnetic effects on cellular function or on the other electromagnetic systems in our bodies. And so there's a lot of importance to these events, and it had long been speculated that these were extinction-level events. Those might 
uh, those of you who are at the channel might recall and you can see up here, um, we got in a little bit of an academic tiff with a professor from Harvard earlier this year who had suggested that uh, these magnetic reversals and magnetic excursions were not extinction level events and that they really weren't that dangerous to the biosphere. Unfortunately, they were just looking at one aspect of one of the, of the changes to be expected during one of these events and did not at all look at the known statistical correlations that yes, when we have these magnetic excursions, uh, we also tend to have the extinction level events come with it. And essentially, uh, it was just weeks later that this paper by Dr. James Channel and, and his co-author came out and really stamped the idea, really put the thing to rest. Um, it really was sort of a silly little tiff. Um, but moving on, this magnetic excursion is important because it happens much more often than people think when they're talking about magnetic changes on the planet. People know that the long-term, you know, cron reversals, what we normally think of as a magnetic reversal, take hundreds of thousands of years in between them and the actual process of the reversals take thousands of years. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here. There's evidence of a magnetic res uh, reversal around the time that Toba blew, around 70, 72,000 years ago. There is strong evidence of a magnetic excursion in the Vostok ice cores dating about 60,000 years ago. The Lachamp excursion, or the last champ as some call it in this country, uh, occurred about 45 to 48,000 years ago, maybe a little bit earlier. It's hard to tell with some of those, but that one was a global event. Before that, we had Mono Lake go off uh, about you know, 35, 36,000 years ago, maybe a little earlier again. Uh, Lake Mungo was about 24 to 28,000 years ago, and the Gothenburg magnetic excursion was about 12 to 13,000 years ago. That is six of these events, and they're spaced about 12,000 years apart. Now, here we are about 12 to 13,000 years from the last one, and in case you've had your head under a rock, geologists, um, Earth's magnetic field is currently changing like it hasn't changed in thousands of years. And this level of change um, has the chance to rapidly accelerate here in, the coming, um, here in the coming century. And when we take a look at what the European Space Agency was able to determine about these changes in the field, that basically we had gone from losing 5% of the field per century, which is a very rapid change compared to the thousands of years before when the field was relatively stable. We've gone from losing 5% per century to 5% per decade. You know, that 10% that NASA said we had lost in the year 2000, they upgraded that to 15% in just 2010. So we can extrapolate that from there. This is unquestionably the most important civilization maintenance level long period cycle on the earth. And Unfortunately, we're about the right time from the last one, and we're seeing, magically, the magnetic changes on the planet as well that go with it. So um, that's concerning enough. What's more concerning is that there appear to have been hints of civilization before this, and hints of surviving this last one. And they seem to talk about you know, the, the ancestors and the rock and the ice that we have dated from the last one. Uh, you know, the Younger Dryas was a really terrible, icy period. And interestingly, the people don't blame meteors. They all blame the sun as the destroyer. These stories are told in rock and voice over and over again. And they are repeatedly told through the centuries and through the millennia with the sun playing the role of the destroyer and also with a considerable amount of cold coming with it. There has been an exceptional amount of evidence that we have gone over, and um, it would be impossible to go through it all here, but from the Earth perspective, from the astrophysics perspective, from the galactic astrophysics perspective, there are mechanisms for this cyclical event to be occurring throughout the entire solar system. And in fact, we do see a lot of changes on the other planets that would be you know, they're making us think that they are magnetic changes as well. It's the type of things that are indicative of the magnetic changes, especially given some of the space weather and weather studies here on Earth. You know, certain things happen on the sun, 
certain zonal winds change or cloud levels change, things like that. It's the same kind of things that you would expect if a planet's magnetism was changing in terms of its interaction with the solar wind. In the case of Jupiter, its radio emission is changing. Uh, and radio emission at that scale is caused by electrons caught in the magnetic field. And unless the electron has fundamentally changed in Jupiter to get the change in radio emissions, you have to have a change in the magnetic fields. And so we are seeing this not only at the other planets, but we are seeing these types of events at other stars as well that are nearby. And it part of the greater hypothesis could be that there's actually a part of the galaxy that is more inducing of these events, both from the sun and in the other planets and here on Earth. It's affecting us all at the same time. Tons of evidence of that. Uh, we've gone over a lot of evidence about what is going on beneath our feet. It's nice to think about Earth as a nice shell layer on top of a sea of molten rock and iron and other metals uh, on top of the core, but it's just not so. There's large scale structure beneath our feet and this has just been discovered and really mapped and better understood in the last few years. What this means for Earth, if in fact the sun does play a role as the isotope evidence suggests, as the people's voice, you know, and, and what they carved into rock suggests, and as the astrophysics themselves suggest, um, you know, mo modern day space weather can already access the mantle. We know that. Any kind of super flare or worse could touch the core. And at that point, you've basically got a solar induced geomagnetic jerk and a bad week on Earth. There is evidence that the CIA attempted to cover up the truth about this twice. Um, once with how they refused to let this story come out and classified it and two, with how they actually sent one of their top scientists into the university pool to basically parade around as a professor and publish a whole bunch of quasi-truthful, mostly, nonsens uh, mostly nonsensical, limited hangout type information that really did nothing more but kill the entire field of study, uh, which was probably the, the attempt at that point. Uh, all of this information whether you want to know about the peer-reviewed papers I was talking about at the start, whether you want to know more about the solar cycles, um, more about the other planets and how they're changing, uh, or what's going on in the mantle and that large-scale structure that you saw a bit, uh, all of those links are below this video. Uh, I'm going to take this moment to answer a couple of questions. Yes, the conference tickets are still sold out. We will be uh, taking in cancellations. We've had a couple already and group them all together and we'll be putting those tickets back up for sale uh, in the springtime. The third edition of Weatherman's Guide to the Sun, our textbook will not be available until summer, but you will be able to get that same discount that the university uh, uh, libraries and the university bookstores get. Um, again, all of those links are found below. Um, for a moment, the rest of you just stop uh, thinking I'm talking to you. Uh, for those of you who this video is actually meant for, I hope that this and this little summary and the links that you find there below, don't think that, you know, just because of where you are, you don't have to do homework anymore. Um, this is everything you need to fully understand that this is not just 55 different coincidences lining up back to back to back to back. This is a very real story and it is laid out for us and it is very, very lucky that science has progressed in all these different ways to be able to come back and help geology in the way it is now. Um, professors who emailed me got a lot of guts. Um, best of luck. And for those who you're listening, I'll see you in the morning. Be safe, everyone.